All right, and thank you for uh, inviting me. The, this title is actually a title of a book, and this book is not yet published. So again, this, I think this conference really giving a slice of research is a 400-page book, and I hope you get some ideas of what this is really about. Uh, in doing so, of course, I want to uh, acknowledge my co-author, uh, who was my postdoc five years ago, Gregoire Marito, and he's now a professor at ETH in Switzerland. Also want to, of course, acknowledge Wiley Blackfell for publishing the book and uh, my students who are here uh, who have contributed a lot to this talk and I will as well have a poster, Peshman uh, Tamasebi, who is a postdoc and Louis Lee who is a first year PhD student. So I think this conference can be framed in a bigger challenge in science and engineering that I've seen in many areas of research. So really we're dealing with two big areas of science, is data science and physical science. So in the data science we talk about big data, but often I, you know, big data for me is, well if you're forecasting it's still really a sparse problem. It's still a problem about uncertainty and certainly in the area that I work with this is very important. On the other side we've seen the growth of very big simulation models. In the subsurface we've been doing that for a very long time, simulation of geology, simulation of flow, a simulation of geomechanics, structural geology, etc. So maybe a challenge is how to merge these two fields. Really how to come up with physically realistic models that are data charged and hopefully provide us better forecast and maybe not just better forecast in sort of being accurate but also being realistic about uncertainty. So traditionally I've worked a lot in geostatistics is where I started my career and uh, just this is a field that has been developed uh, tremendously at uh, Stanford. It started actually in the mines in South Africa by Danny Krieg, then was formalized by Georges Matron in the 1960s. And one of his students, Andre Journel, came to Stanford and built this really practical application of geostatistics in many areas of the earth sciences. Uh, Andre retired five years ago and, you know, you could say that the bread and butter of traditional geostatistics is this kind of problem, that we have a physical truth, we got some limited sample data, and then people do either inter estimation, which is called universal Krieging, or they do simulation, which often is done in a multi-Gaussian framework, and you create multiple realizations of the truth. So if you look at this Gaussian models and you compare that to this physical truth, which is actually the DEM near Walker Lake, uh, it's an area in the Sierra Nevada, you see that it doesn't at all look like the truth. And that is some of the aspects that I try to address is how to put physical realism in stochastic modeling data charged. Why is this happening? And we started really fundamentally looking at this problem. Well, the, fundamentally why this is happening of people express relationships using covariances or spatial temporal covariances. If you just look at these three images, you don't have to be an expert in geology to say first they're very different. You don't have to be a reservoir engineer to say that if you're going to produce from these systems, you're going to get something very different. Yet the spatial covariance is the same of all these images. Here we see actually not the spatial covariance, we see the variogram, which is a me measure of spatial dependency that is traditionally used in geostatistics. So neither the data nor the statistics that are traditionally calculated can differentiate at all any of these models. And typically what we end up is something like this, which is geologically unrealistic. So in geostatistics, people have worked a lot theoretically with the, what is called the random function model. It's a part of probability theory where you need to rely on a lot of difficult concepts such as stationarity or codicity other things, infinite domain, in order to formulate and say really that the truth is a realization of a stochastic process. And then in the end we often say that this realization is sometimes decomposed into two problems, a mean problem, some kind of average that is fl up, fluctuating up and down, and a variation around that mean. So if I show you this picture on the left, which is a physical simulation of geology, and you ask geologists now to say what is the mean and what is the residual, Obviously, we are entering a problem here. We can't really apply this. So that is really why multipoint geostatistics was born. It was born only 10, 15 years ago, and it's truly a Stanford product, and has been taken up by many other researchers in the world. It's, of course, an extension to higher order statistics, but 
What we recognized immediately is that to extend to higher order statistics, you can't go incremental. It's not the third order and the fourth order and the fifth order. That didn't improve anything. Actually, it made things more complicated. The models got more complicated, the estimation became more complicated, and nobody was using that. So it failed. The second thing that we have to realize is that if we want to communicate physics with statistics, we have to have a bridge. And that bridge is the training images. And I will talk about that in extenso. It's a little deceiving, this word image, because it's not 2D, it's 4D. It's spatial, temporal, and it's an example of what you believe is physically realistic. We also notice in this field an increase in the use of computer science over statistical science, and particularly computer graphics. And we'll talk about that. What is computer graphics? Well, computer graphics, just ask your kids. Computer games, you know, movies, uh, things like that, where people use textures and texture synthesis to create sort of, you know, we want to create a, a wall in a movie, just piece of a, a pattern of a wall, and you paste it on that, and this movie game, uh, this, uh, this game will then produce this wall. The movie is still, the game is still 2D, unfortunately. So there are some interesting connections to that. However, in geostatistics, we're dealing with a much more complicated problem. First of all, it's not 2D, it's 4D, it's space-time. And in, in Bionos' case, it's 5D. Secondly, our Earth textures are very organized, they're very non-stationary, they're very specific, and they, they have to follow certain physical rules. Right? If you think about channel deposition, something like that, then uh, it needs to follow certain rules. So we would like to design algorithms that can take patterns that are now Earth patterns in 4D and make replicates almost on the fly, but, and this is where it becomes difficult, we need to be constrained to data. Data either taken as samples, wells, seismic, geophysics, remote sensing, soil samples, everything that's out there is data. How do I create a pattern constrained to data? Texture synthesis people don't have to worry about that. I'm going to show you two kind of basic ideas, basic principles, and please don't read too much into it. It's a whole lot more complicated, but it sort of shows the little design of these algorithms to create these kind of realizations. The first one is beautiful in its simplicity, and it also relies on this unique idea that was proposed by Shannon in 1948. And I don't have to explain this person uh, to an audience of computer scientists, is that the first sample is basically a sample of your PDF. You don't need the PDF. You just need the sample. So there's no need for random function theory. So if you imagine this situation would be a typical situation in earth sciences. You have three samples, and you would like to know what's in the middle. Right? That's a geostatistical problem. You can calculate covariances and solve Kriegen system and matrices and stuff like that. Well, if we have an image like that, what we just do is look in this image where I have a match with this data configuration. If I don't have a match, I move to the next, move to the next, I have a match, I take it and I paste it. That's it. That's the algorithm. And you go on and you generate uh, complete uh, realizations of the image. So this is called the direct sampling algorithm, uh, which is published. Another beautiful kind of idea that we have developed is what I call stochastic puzzling. If you, want, if you have some kind of a pattern, like here on the, on the right-hand side, so in order to create images, you do what your kids do, right? Is you take the whole thing, you cut them to pieces, you throw it up in the air, and then you start puzzling. And the way you puzzle is you start at the border. And then you go, try to go along a line. That's called the raster path uh, in simulation. So we put a, a puzzle piece. Then the next puzzle piece, we have to worry whether it interlocks with the previous puzzle piece. So we look up in this image here where that occurs. If you find one, we put it there, and we move on, and, and we can complete the puzzle like this. Both algorithms direct sampling, which is more of a pixel-based technique, and uh, image quilting, which is more of a pattern technique, are extraordinarily fast. Right? You can imagine that you can create 4D images very fast. And for an ex a non-expert statistician, it's very easy to use. There's no positive definite covariance and all the kind of other things you have to worry about. So that leads to the fast generation of uh, complex spatial variability from existing spatial variability that you may have uh, obtained. Here we see three examples, and here we see, using these two algorithms, realizations, and I can generate a million more of that. 
right? You may have uh, a delta. Here we see actually, we'll talk about that in a bit, a flume experiment uh, or a fractured system, which of course uh, today is very important. It can generate ma many realizations. Take, for example, this here is a six million cell model is, is generated in four seconds. Okay, let's talk a little bit about applications. And the area that I work in is, is the subsurface reservoir forecasting. So the forecasting is really uh, the problem here. The forecasting of, first of all, what are reserves, what are recovery factors, uh, where do we drill wells, and if we drill the wells there, what I can expect in terms of production. Uh, and this can be applied to all gas, water, CO2 sequestration, anything that basically has to do with the subsurface. Some typical problems about the subsurface that are very different from the what I call the above surface sciences is this large uncertainty in the nature of the positional system. Despite all the great data that uh, Bionda shows, we still don't know a whole lot about the subsurface, particularly at the very small scale. And this small scale matters. A fracture is very thin, but it matters. A shale barrier that's very thin, it matters when you start uh, producing, and a lot of these things cannot be imaged or clearly imaged by seismic. And seismic is an important contribution, but it doesn't resolve everything. The second problem we have in the subsurface is we have very large data and we have very large models. We're talking about billion cell grids now with multiple properties and very large simulations. The second big problem that we have, which I'm not gonna talk about, is grid. We have very complicated structures in the subsurface, faults, layers, you know, things that are complicated that requires extremely complex gridding as some of the areas that Margot uh, is working on. And we have the availability of a large variety uh, of data. So the current challenge in doing this is basically these two fields. We have big data, data that uh, is just shown in the previous talk, and we have big simulations. And we'll talk about what that is exactly. The subsurface is geology. This is what is so different from the above surface part. There is a medium, and this medium is created through some geological genesis and process. So we have to talk a little about what geologists do, because it's very important work. There are sort of three areas geologists work. First, they work in the lab. Uh, we're working with uh, Chris Paola, who is a sedimentary geologist at the University of Minnesota. It was a tank, and in this tank is basically a five by five meter cage where you have sediments come in and they get distributed. And here, then you can take this, uh, like the remote sensing people, those snapshots, either pictures or LIDAR pictures, uh, basically every second. So think about data creation just like that. Here we see, for example, a zoom, and, and here is the source of the sediments. And the patterns that you see in this tank are just incredibly beautiful. And they just look like patterns when you fly over the Mississippi Delta, when you fly over uh, you know, Utah or areas like that, and you see these various depositions. The other thing we can do with a tank is one that is created, we can take slices through it, vertical slices, kind of shave it off, and then take pictures of that. And then we see, guess what? very beautiful geological patterns that are being created. And we have here very large data sets. And we can create these models. Uh, we have hundreds of these tank experiments. So this is one area, I think, where geologists try to get our understanding. A second area is computer modeling. So people try to actually generate the geology at the time of deposition. They try to recreate the Earth as if it were deposited. And that requires PDEs, rules of erosion and deposition, uh, and a lot of genesis that needs to go in. And that's the physics uh, of the problem. Here's a model that is created by ExxonMobil uh, of a turbidite deposit, and it takes one month of computing time just to create one single physically realistic model uh, of the subsurface. So because it takes such a long time, but it creates really something that is extremely realistic, uh, people now do also what is called process mimicking models, where you try to sort of mimic the physics. It's not really accurate, but it creates you something, uh, at least it has very realistic, say, these meandering shapes. And of course, the other thing that geologists do is go out in the field and look at outcrops and look at measurements there and take measurements there. Uh, and these days, there's a lot of uh, interest, of course, in using photogrammetry and all the new devices and stuff like that to uh, very rapidly look at outcrops and, and uh, create them and then come back and maybe do some basic 
computer modeling. So this is all great, right? It, it allows us to understand geology, it understands genesis, but it doesn't do anything for forecasting. These are not numerical models that I can say, put in some core forecasting system, a flow simulator or something else, and create actual numbers of oil rates or other gas rates or water rates or whatever you want. That is why we need Beyondo, big data. So here we have a data set from any uh, of, you know, this is the kind of data that shows. It's not, it's not a passive, this is active, right? And it's shot. And uh, these are very large data set. Here we see, uh, look in depth, and the target reservoir may be somewhere just down here. I'm actually not interested in that. I'm interested in this here. Okay. If I take a, a, a small slice through here, and I look from the top, I see this here occurring. And if I look at that a little closer, I see that. I see, guess what, channels. And then people say, great, now I've got the answer. No, you don't have the answer yet. This doesn't tell me how much oil I'm going to produce in the next 10 years. Secondly, it's velocity. It doesn't tell me what is porosity and permeability. It doesn't tell me where the fluids are. It is an indication to it, but it doesn't tell me that exactly. Okay. Then, of course, geologists come and say, yeah, this is all great, but there's more detail to it. There is sub-seismic variability that is very important to the forecasting that I'm going to do, and that will need to be uh, generated. So in any, they created a, with these process models, a 3D turbidite model. This is a, a turbidite is basically an underwater deposition of, of, fruval, of channels of sand and shale, and created this model. So basically now we have this big simulation, and we have this big data, and we need to merge them and try to forecast. So what we did with this is say, well, this is realistic geologically, but doesn't match data. This is the data, but it is not necessarily what I want. So let's use this as a training image and image quilt our way, including having some wells. And in those wells, I have recorded geology. And I can generate many, many hundreds of realizations of the subsurface that reflect both the data and the geology at the same time. So here we see, for example, if you look a little closer, you don't see the well here, and that's good, because that means that the model is matching exactly at that location, that information. So you see, it's 4D puzzling, right? Actually, it's 3D puzzling. Imagine having a box of puzzles, but you need to put the puzzles together. At the same time, you need to constrain to this point data. So that's the strength of these uh, algorithms. Then we can do multi-phase flow, and unfortunately, the projector doesn't want to show oil. So here's the oil rate. Uh, over time, which is uncertain. It's very uncertain, in fact, in these kind of systems. And then companies can make decisions about risk, uh, deciding to drill their platforms where they want to drill them. So this was really uniquely an area developed for subsurface and has now, in the last 10 years, has seen a rapid explosion. And I think that's a healthy sign in a lot of areas in the earth sciences. And we're going to talk a little bit about those things. Um, and this is not my research. So these are publications of others that have been published. And there are sort of uh, three areas here that, I, uh, that I, uh, I'm going to talk about. And they show a little bit different sort of complexity. Some, some problems are temporal, other are spatial temporal, other are multivariate temporal. Uh, all of them sort of have to deal with large data sets. The first one is, is remote sensing and gap filling, which is a problem when you have remote sensing data and you need basically to deal with orbits uh, that, you know, characteristics that are missing in the data. So people in, in, in the traditional statistical field have looked at this and they solve this through covariances, but that requires the inversion of million size covariance matrices, which we don't have to do. And plus, if you use covariances, you will still only capture the second order of the data. So here we apply, here these orders uh, apply these uh, direct sampling technique and create from the existing data itself, right? Because it does have characteristics that are there. This is multivariate. This is, uh, look at the soil moisture, uh, latent heat, uh, temperature, and soil moisture. So it's a multivariate temporal problem that you can immediately fill in uh, the gap. And this is, sorry, done in the, the bottom here, right? Without any uh, intervention, much by the user. Uh, another example is when you're satellite data is covered with clouds, and those clouds are moving, you can sort of directly generate this uh, fill-in or gap fill. 
Another area, again, um, it's not very visible here necessarily, but um, we have the stochastic uh, generation of rainfall. This is now time series, so it is not that it's just a spatial problem. You can also work in time. Here we see the rainfall in Darwin uh, over 10 years and over 100 days, and this is the simulated rainfall in Darwin over 100 years, uh, 10 days, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, 100 days and 10 years. Here we see actually the same thing. It's the non station. The black line is the actual uh, rainfall in Darwin, again, over 70 years. You see this very complicated dry wet uh, periods, and then you have this non-stationary effect. And this is a direct sample simulation again, and we can do many simulations, and we can then forecast percentiles and things like that. There's some other authors uh, in IEEE have published how you can do that in space. Uh, here we have a now red image of ground-based uh, weather radar, which we can combine with cloud top temperatures uh, that we can then simulate basically uh, replicates of radar and the east coast of rain in the east coast, and thereby this is used then in uh, data simulation ensemble modeling for meteorological applications. A last one, which I think is which I find personally very interesting, uh, because we saw we have the similar problem, is downscaling. Often, when you do physical simulations and you create large simulations, you can only do it on a really coarse grid, and we need to create stuff that's on a finer grid to make actual forecasts. And in the reservoir, this is a very hot topic as well, because we can't really do simulations at a very, very fine grid. We have to go to this uh, coarse grid. We can only do it on a coarse grid, sorry. We have to go to this very fine grid. And it's the same problem, of course, of course in the climate uh, modeling. So here we see uh, three climate um, variables, basically, for Australia. And these authors wanted to create fine-scale models for watershed modeling. Right? And the core scale climate models don't give you the necessary information at the, it's only at the 50 kilometer scale. You need to have it at the 10 kilometer scale. Right? So they used, what they did is they used a shorter sequence of the climate model, physical downscaling, which takes a very amount, a large amount of computing time, time, and they used that as statistical relationships here to directly downscale that information for a very long extended uh, period of time. And that was uh, quite successful. In this case, you see that you can create from these large-scale models very fine-scale uh, features uh, on this. Here you see some more data, for example. Here's the large-scale climate model. You see it almost averages out the entire coast, uh, yet you can see that it produces these very fine-scale features uh, that will be then used for further modeling. All right, I'll, I'll keep it there and, and maybe formulate a few takeaways for you. Hope you get some appetite for purchasing the book when it comes out in a few months. And uh, this is all the, you know, the uh, advertisement. It's academic advertising. So what is multipoint geostatistics? It's a random functionless modeling uh, that has become, I think, a hybrid between computer graphics and traditional geostatistics. Uh, it relies on training images that are either physical experiments, right? You're going to put the physics in the statistics. And I think what is really driving this and, and what has been the success is that you, you can use it as a non-expert. And I think that is very important. I'm, I, I love statistics, and I've done my PhD in that area. But the models that are being created are very, very difficult to understand for the non-expert user. And this has been my personal experience. When I go teach courses in the industry for a geologist, and you start talking about positive definite covariances, it doesn't go very far. And people just ignore it. So, Providing them with a framework that's an image that where you can sort of um, uh, sort of uh, communicate statistical variation in something explicit, and then have automated algorithms that do this very fast without parameter estimations or complicated maximum likelihood or Markov chain Monte Carlo. We are avoiding any of that. Uh, while these are great parts of, of, of statistical research, uh, for practice it doesn't really work very well. So with that, I have, I have one more morbid ending uh, in terms of uh, the slide that Margot also showed. Right? Do you trust your covariance relationships? Here we see the relationship between US spending on science and suicide. It's 99% correlation. Thereby, I propose we cut all funding to all universities in order to help those poor people. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff? Yes, 
Thank you, Jeff. My name is Bob Entrican from Electric Power Research Institute. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the work that you're doing for stochastic modeling of the downscaling climate, yeah. other weather phenomenon. Have you tried uh, combinations of weather phenomena like rainfall, wind, insulation, et cetera, mm -hmm. combined and uh, characterizing the correlations? So as I said, this is not my research. Right, the, the 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 last three applications I showed are by other authors. It's actually the research of my uh, of my postdoc now uh, co-author here. Um, one of the challenges uh, for this is what you describe as multivariate. That it's not just about forecasting one thing; it's about forecasting a set of of, of phenomenon. And I think uh, there is still there's great potential, but there's still really interesting research to be done in solving this multivariate problem. What we notice with multivariate uh, problems is that the correlation is often complex and complicated. And sort of relying on the standard covariance and cross covariance models often leads to an overconfidence in the correlation. I think the last example is a very simplistic example, but it shows it. And so what we're trying to do with this kind of work is, is discovering pattern relationships in space time. That is really what it is about, pattern relationships, not just point to point relationships. And how to discover that uh, and how to use that uh, information. Maybe I'm not um, necessarily an expert at that, but I can imagine, again, that you can rely on some physical modeling that can explain you what the relationship are, and then you can use that information in some forecasting models. So what we're doing here is basically decoupling the physical modeling from the actual forecasting. We're learning from physical models in order to make the forecast much more realistic. We have time for one more question right here. Uh, you mentioned, uh, I'm Lev Tabarovsky from Baker Hughes. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uncertainties in the first slide or the second. And I'm wondering, when you separate data and the images, yes. uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in correlating images yeah. to data, and yeah. there be, can be multiple images yes. which you can yes. supply to obtain the same data. Yes. And we usually are very interested in this multitude of images mm -hmm. or models which can be uh, correlated with the data. So what you do about this certainty and uncertainty? Yeah. Do you provide multiple images mm -hmm. yeah. or how it works? Yeah. Very, very, very excellent question. I think it, it's the, the problem in the industry, exactly what you describe, is people use one image, people use one model, people use one concept, one idea. That is the understatement of uncertainty because basically people look at the seismic and say, beautiful, that's it. And then they walk away, try to drill a well, and they drill a well in the middle of the channel. I've seen it twice happen this year with the companies at Oracle. It's all shale, all of it. So what we're advocating, and we have two chapters on what you describe, is multiple training images and discovery of scenario uncertainty. That you can discover actually that there are not one training image, of course, but there is a, a, a discrete set of images that are exp explaining your data. The second problem you describe is that of consistency between physical modeling and data science. We have an entire chapter that talks about validation and consistency, because that is the most difficult part, is to come up with a series of images that not only describe the uncertainty, but also rely, ex, uh, are consistent with your data. And it's, it's a current the most important ongoing part of research in my group. So yes, thank you. Please join me in thanking Jeff once again. Thank you.